नमस्कार दर्शकों मैं हूं विभूति झा और यह है जयपुर डायलॉग यूएसए आपका स्वागत है थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग टुडे पहले की तरह मैं आज आपसे फिर अनुरोध करूंगा प्लीज लाइक सब्सक्राइब एंड सपोर्ट आर चैनल गिव योर फीडबैक एंड सपोर्ट एवरी विच वे पॉसिबल थैंक यू आप लोगों को लास्ट लास्ट वीक में हमने चर्चा की थी एक खास पर्पस के लिए कि करीबन बारह लोग मिले और हम लोगों ने एक किताब लिखी जिसका चैप्टर है उसको कहते हैं हम जियो पॉलिटिक्स रीडिफाइंड दिस वाज अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक दैट वी टुक बिकॉज वी आर कॉलिंग इट पंक्चरिंग ट्रूथ्स एंड ग्लैमराइज लाइज तो जो नैरेटिव जो होती है ना सारी दुनिया में वो जियो पॉलिटिक्स की एक बहुत बड़ी पहल होती है कि हम क्या होना चाहते हैं आज से पंद्रह बीस साल पच्चीस साल बाद तो उसकी शुरुआत आज करनी पड़ती है सिंपल सा उदाहरण है कि अगर आप 50 किलो वजन लूज करना चाहेंगे तो वो हो सकता है लेकिन वो कल नहीं होगा उसके लिए इसको समय देना पड़ेगा उसके लिए आपको कमिटमेंट करनी पड़ेगी फिर एक टाइम के ऊपर वो होता है सो so, आज हम लोगों ने सेकेंड ऑफ द सीरीज में इस बात की चर्चा करना चाहता हूं कि उस टॉप उस 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 चैप्टर उस किताब में दो चैप्टर लिखी गई हैं हमारे आज के मेहमान हैं अंकित शाह जी जिनको सब जानते हैं और अगर कोई नहीं जानता है तो आज फिर जान ले अंकित शाह जी हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं और दूसरी है वीनस उपाध्याय जी वीनस उपाध्याय जी इज जर्नलिस्ट दिल्ली में रहती हैं और यूएस का जो ईपॉक टाइम्स है उसकी इंडिया कॉरेस्पॉन्डेंट है डिड आई सेड करेक्टली वीनस जी डिड आई सेड करेक्टली या उनको साउंड का थोड़ा गड़बड़ हो रहा है But I hope okay. you are able to connect it on that. So, Vinay yeah. ji, I want to. I, I was muted. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Very well said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. आप जो है हेडफोन हटा लीजिए बाकी सब क्लियर हो गया. Now I wanted to kick off the conversation today with Vinay ji because you have written a chapter on infrastructure and the politics, the geopolitics of infrastructure growth in India. Are you? खुद ही इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर की डेवलपमेंट की विक्टिम हुई है इन द लास्ट फ्यू डेज दैट योर ट्विटर अकाउंट वाज हैक्ड एंड यू नो द एंटायर थिंग वेंट अपसाइड डाउन सो क्वेश्चन दैट कम्स अबाउट इज कि यू जैसे अंकित जी ने अपने चैप्टर में भी लिखा है इसके बारे में कि हाउ डज वन मेंटेन द कंट्रोल हाउ डज वन मेंटेन द सेंटिटी द वेरासिटी of the entire infrastructure that grows and it goes out of control <laughs> mm-hmm. how do you relate that with the going forward because prime minister modi ji ne kaha tha aur aapne iske bare mein kitab mein charcha bhi ki hai ki infrastructure growth and development is about people not only capital outlays go ahead vinay ji yes yes so the the most important and significant thing that is about india's growth story today is that we are one sixth of the humanity you know so and and then we are a very young population so this means that the growth and the the, the our growth story is not only about us it is actually about you know a lot about the world today as well in that context the surprising thing is that we started to think about inclusive infrastructure development by inclusive i mean like you know you just mentioned about you know my twitter account my x account being hacked uh so it's very important for us to understand that infrastructure growth is not just about physical infrastructure it's digital infrastructure it's social infrastructure and that is something which is called inclusive in infrastructural growth when all these three parameters are included in it surprisingly this in this inclusive approach to our infrastructural growth it started only in 2014 so so which means that we have come a long way but we have still a long way to go ahead we have come a long way and we still have a long way to go that's so long way to go ahead a long long way to go ahead and more importantly also because today's economic growth for today's economic growth infrastructural development is a very important tool you cannot think about economic growth if you do not have a proportional infrastructural development happening along and again when i say infrastructural development i mean the physical infrastructure 
the digital infrastructure as well as the social infrastructure and more importantly we do not have a so it's inclusive that's one part of it another thing is it's not a linear perspective to infrastructure you know today things are very cross cutting multiple sectors of growth they are cross cutting which means that today's infrastructural growth it is also about a foreign policy it is also about our national security you know it is also about obviously about our strategic strength and therefore it is also about the growth of our democracy very well i i definitely agree with you because the the growth and development is far too rapid today thanks to technology now we know about more ankit ji talking about infrastructure you know you have written a chapter on uh, you know life cycle of currency and that's a very important one because both of us know that jab se aankhe khuli hain 1971 ki taraf ki baat karte hain to change from barter to gold standard to digital today the nature of currency has changed the nature of currency has changed nature of trade and settlements have changed how do you see this play out in favor of india or against india because those who jo piche rehte hain aur wo technology samay mein ek sath jud jate hain to unko advantage hota hai time factor ka jaise india telecom industry mein ita industry thi indian telephone industry landline banate the ab india mein landline ki zarurat hi nahi hai kisi ko so we took advantage of the technology leap in telecom uh, arena how do you see the currency evolution that is happening and the biggest thing because i did couple of courses on you know blockchain and all for learning purposes and came to realize that har ek course ki ek mahatva thi that was very interesting the success of digital currency will be a function of transparency regulatory framework liquidity this will determine whether digital will succeed or not transparency liquidity trust and regulatory environment kon kar raha control kar raha hai your thoughts on that how does india fit in or take advantage of that see uh, if if we are to compare the entire human existence then it is more than clear that it is the gold which is the real currency and uh, rest all is credit i mean whether you print a note and now whether you go it for digital electronic entries as tokens or whatever private crypto or whatever that you call it uh, but the fact of the matter is that this very idea that uh, i am going to invest into somebody else's business uh, to stay rich uh, has uh, taken proportions of growth to a point where now there are no real people left to use their hands and legs and make a real product uh, and the british classroom format has aided that uh, currency shifts uh, uh, from classroom to jobs now as we move towards this financial reset uh, and people realize that and i think it's it's the western citizens who are realizing it first hand where they get freebies deposited to their accounts i mean they get cash doles but then there are no real products to buy with that cash so i mean for how long you can fool people because cash does not generate real product unless there is some real production backing the cash right so it just increases the inflation and nothing else if the if the supply of goods real goods is not there right. so i think as the world realizes this uh, that we are moving towards a closure of a single country reserve currency cycle of 400 years i'll be not surprised a lot of western universities are going to file bankruptcies in the coming years uh, and we go back again to the skills based model so all the fiat dollar cities which the the, the fiat currency model established worldwide Uh, by breaking the family unit entrepreneurship model which was going on based on the savings lifestyle uh, which is what matches with the ancient sanatan economics model uh, based on you know wealth being passed on as savings to the next generation uh, based on keeping the birth rates also intact 
I think that kind of ancient wisdom is going to come back very soon when they realize that they have all the wealth of the world, but then the one who is possessing the wealth is not able to secure that wealth because they have not maintained the birth rates. So you might have a lot of wealth being accumulated, but if a radical crowd comes every evening and stands outside for one hour, that say, for example, a property is 40 crore will come down to 4 crore. Right. So uh, we got to understand uh, that all the Western indexes which were imposed with the uh, with the fiat currency and especially after the Second World War, those indexes are wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Per capita is one of the most ridiculous index we are using, because even if one person holds the entire wealth of the nation, the per capita number will be the same for the entire nation, isn't it? Similarly, GDP is another wrong index. Uh, you have consumption added to investment. One is a capital item, another is a revenue item. Now, an 11th standard kid can tell you that in order to measure financial performance, you cannot add a capital item with a revenue item. But still, countries are continuing with the GDP index. Why? Because the West has the single country reserve currency status. And they can print endless money because 180 plus nations destroyed the demand and value of their own currencies. So for them, even if they don't do anything, just print the currency, still the GDP would go up because they do not have any difference between capital and revenue. Zero to three percent interest rates means free money. At least for the last three decades, the average is zero to three percent interest rates which is why the entire family institution is destroyed in the West. Right. Because the role of the father is the dollar, the role of the mother is the dollar, the role of the husband is the dollar, the role of the wife is the, the dollar, the role of the children is the dollar, children being kicked out of their family at the age of 14, 15, and they also go out because the interest rates are 0 to 3%, essentially free money. Right. All right. Indian children won't go out of their house because they don't get this free money. Besides, uh, these governments, because of the single country reserve currency status, able to give retirement benefits, Medicaid and whatnot to the parents. So why would they also be interested in keeping the children home? Right. This is not the case with other countries who have to earn their money to spend something. So I think uh, the realization is very clear. Uh, we are heading towards a big financial reset and the Sanatan economics gold is going to come back the wisdom of gold, which is the real currency. So whatever new digital format comes, it is going to be backed by gold in the formula. Not that they are going to exchange real physical gold. Right. The new currency formula will be digital backed by gold. But I will come back to you with a question about, you know, this uh, private crypto versus the government controlled central bank issued crypto, you know, Eventually, it will be a battle of control and management because you do not want money to go out of control. And right now, as you said, because of the fiat nature of the currency printing going on, everything looks to be controlled by only a few, not, not for the many. But Vinaji, I will come back to you on a very important element that you touched in your article, and that is about heritage and soft power. And I'm very glad that I brought both of you together because one is talking about the infrastructure of money and you are talking about infrastructure of varieties of things. So this is, there is a background to it. This is my favorite topic for India. 2007, I was in Florida speaking at an India, India, it is a global event in which we were talking about India. How will India sustain? This was in 2007. How would India sustain a growth rate of 9% if it doesn't have skilled manpower? And what does opportunity mean in the Indian context? So I had narrated to the audience then 2007, and I gave two statistics, which is very close to what you are written in the chapter here. And I said, think about it as of today's data of that time. United States has a population of 325 million people. We have approximately 6,500 plus aircrafts serving the flying needs of Americans domestic and local, uh, international. India has a population of 1.2 billion people, and we have about 350 aircrafts. 
So I said, think about it. 350 aircraft serving 1.2 billion people versus 6,000 plus aircraft serving the flying needs of 320 million people. So look at, juxtapose the opportunity that India has to develop with domestic travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. And to that, yes. I also added the second data that in the hotel industry, hospitality industry itself, India at that time had 100,000 rooms for one star, mm -hmm. five star hotels. Vegas alone had 100,000 rooms. Mm -hmm. Las Vegas alone. So I had said that if the government of India were to focus on domestic travel, tourism, and we have enormous cultural heritage, which yes. are, nobody goes to see them because there is no infrastructure. Yes. So yeah. I had a point that if government of India mm -hmm. just begins to focus on developing domestic tourism, preserving its soft power through its cultural elements, that will have the cascading effect or a multiplier effect on the economy on an overall basis. Because we know that when you build a hotel, when you build airlines, you have so many things that need to be developed to build and support that. So that chapter I like very much. Share your thoughts on that. How did you how did you see we started to think about heritage and infrastructure you know i i mean uh, in 2020 when i had to come back to india um i was in dc first in new york and then in dc for an assignment and then galwan happened and uh, i was told that you know in south asia is becoming a very interesting geopolitical theater and that i should go back and i should be reporting you know on all these things and that's when i specifically started to look at the himalayas you know and i started to look at the himalayas as a geopolitical theater that happened because of the context in which i had to return to india and then i realized you know that we always look at himalayas as a heritage you know you you go to south india and you talk to you know the indians about what the thing about the Himalayas, they always have a picture in their head. And this picture is very, very old. You know, it is there in literature. It is there in the mantras that people chant. It is there in the content that people consume on a daily basis. It is there in news. It is in everything. So it's it's the part of the narrative that is there, you know, that, that is there built in, in cultivated in India today. But if you look at, say, 10 years ago, you look at the state of infrastructure just in the Himalayas alone, and you compare the, the growth of that infrastructure in the last 10 years, you will see a you know, a, a, a massive change. Now, why did it only happen in the last 10 years? And why did it not happen before? And from where, from here, at this point of time, where do we go further ahead? And that's where we need to have, a, I feel, a more dynamic understanding of what is meant by a heritage. Because heritage is just not about ASI protected monuments. Our heritage is not just about temples or you know other places of worship or say pilgrimage routes because that's what people understand okay for a lot of people himalayas are about temples and pilgrimage routes okay you can trek here you can trek there but is that only about heritage now keep this context in mind and compare it with what china is doing with its belt and road initiatives the the massive infrastructural corridors the economic corridors the china is this intercontinental intercountry um you know infrastructural projects that china is doing you know, compare it with that and then in today's context when you know players like china they talk about their history which is conflicting with our perception of history or our narrative of history then it means some way we haven't paid attention and again why am i talking about it is because it is very cross-cutting because we need to put more work on it. We need to put more research on it. We need to have more resources for you know, R&D on these aspects. And I started to think about also in, uh, in the context of Nepal, because China is also building these BRI projects in Nepal. And there's a whole lot of Buddhist heritage over there. And you know how that narrative of the heritage is changing? So I'm not saying that we are not doing anything, but I'm saying the entire concept of heritage and soft power 
today in today's world is very different from what it was before and so therefore we need to think you know in the new context in the evolving context uh similarly you know this was territorial heritage we do have you know oceanic heritage um i mean there is a whole lot of work that we need to do a lot of this heritage is uh, intercontinental a lot of this heritage is uh, something that we share with the other, other countries you know not only in the context of we being the origin of buddhism but there are many other aspects that we need to you know identify and cultivate and therefore build our concepts of infrastructure heritage and soft power on that i hope i answered your question yes you did you did very 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 significantly you talked about heritage in more ways than one and that's powerful. you know for example i want to highlight one point here for example just look at the silk route right today chinese consider i mean the the basic narrative about silk route is centered around china but actually silk route was not just china centric you know silk route was something connecting the east and the west and when it passed through what is india's northern frontiers there were many offshoots of silk route which were coming all the way into the you know indian mainland and they were going all the way through the Him entire himalayan territories and some of these silk routes are amazing you, you look at what china has done with it now again in the context of a uh, physical infrastructure growth heritage and soft power the entire karakoram road that china has built it is actually one leg of the silk route it is almost roughly parallelly going along with the ancient silk route you know we also had a silk route you know which used to come from what is today's xinjiang it used to come into leh and then from leh you know it used to come into punjab into amritsar and then from there you know it would go to himachal it would go to rest of the himalayan states and it will go come further to the coastal towns of india you know i've met people uh who used to tell me that who told me that before 1950s you know when these caravan routes were still open the lake khasgar khodan caravan routes are still open there were a lot of these hump uh, you know these camel caravans that were coming in and this was also a route for uh, you know for vigurs to go to uh, what to say saudi arabia for hajj you know and the whole entire journey would take two years if you go to ladakh today you can actually listen to amazing stories you know amazing stories of uh, you know people who are uh, who have that kind of family relationship or if i can use the term heritage relationship right. you know with the with the people across the border but we haven't we didn't have the concept of you know roots as civilizational wealth or intercontinental roots or ancient roots as a you know heritage and soft power uh, you know in that context we never uh, we, we never thought about it whereas the chinese did that's so brilliantly said about you you connected the heritage beyond just a infrastructural issue but you connected the infra heritage to the essential core of what our itihas is all about now coming this, i'm very excited to see this you know being with young people like you makes me young again so <laughs> so the thought process is very remarkable ankit ji aapko to maine sawal pehle hi bata diya tha mera jo inquiry hai jo aapne apne kitab mein apne chapter mein likhi hai why it is you know you there there will be a tussle and a fight between the private crypto and a government controlled crypto what do you think is going to happen eventually if they are going to be linked with gold is gold going to become a new battleground war who has so much gold so um vibhuti ji we we are clearly seeing signals where uh, the western nations are de-dollarizing with the bitcoin and we are clearly seeing that the brics nations are de-dollarizing by accumulating physical gold and this began i think uh, early 2015 itself right so the for around 2014 you saw how the ukraine conflict boiled up internally within ukraine uh, and then you link that with how uh, prime minister narendra modi brought 
uh, the gold monetization scheme in 2015. So uh, it looks that there is an arrangement among the BRICS nations to de-dollarize by accumulating physical gold, which they were started that long back, 2015. Okay. Now, very interestingly, as we know that all the Indian citizens have more gold than uh, any of the central banks. I mean, total of all the central banks put together. So we always knew that gold is the real currency. Now, we've got to understand that the private cryptos have been introduced with the idea of decentralization. Now, decentralization challenges who? Who is challenged by decentralization of currency? Well, uh, we got to understand that the idea of central banks was precisely introduced uh, so that politicians are able to announce freebies during elections. Right. Okay. Because there are only two ways you can announce, uh, you know, benefits to the people. Either you collect tax and sponsor that or your central bank is going to print extra currency and sponsor that and pass on that as an indirect inflation to the people's bills, either of the two. If you impose tax, people know it that you are collecting from them only and giving them the benefits, right. uh, which they would resent. Uh, if you don't collect tax and just print the money, uh, that also passes on as an indirect inflation. But people won't know that it is passing on to them. The freebies are being given to them by that only. So I really doubt this idea that the, that the governments of the world are going to allow uh, dilution of power of regulation of currency from the hands of the central banks. Okay, because until and unless the political format is election and vote bank basis, I don't think the politicians would be... Um, comfortable enough to allow private crypto as a legal tender of money. All right, this is my understanding. Uh, besides, we also got to understand that a lot of companies, which is a company format of doing business, they get uh, a lot of, you know, uh, easy credit because of the centralized banking system. Okay, because of the size and the nature of business that they have, the volume, the trade and the credit worthiness. Right. So they are also not interested in diluting the regulation of currency. Mm -hmm. So the companies are not interested, politicians are not interested. So how will they allow decentralization of currency? That is the first question on the private cryptos. So while the West is de-dollarizing with Bitcoin, uh, the idea is that the Western citizens do not understand, do not get a hint that this is what the de-dollarization script is going on. So they they don't line up in front of banks, deposit to panic like that. Right. So they are temporary de-dollarizing de them by saying that private cryptos are as good as digital gold. <laughs> okay, that is the that is the marketing uh, the thing they are doing. Once the BRICS nations would be ready with the new formula, right. I'm more than sure that the West will dump the private cryptos or regulate them and turn it into a CBDC with that new formula, adopting the new formula. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, this is a very deep insight you gave about the machinations and control of the whole process. Now I wanted to come back to both of you uh, with, with an issue of a structural system that India needs to follow. We all know, all of us know that the world is right now in a conflict zone between capitalism and come and and the Chinese way of doing things. China dominates that entire conversation. Now, China and the United States are competing in virtually every single field of life, including Olympics, where they both shared 40 gold medals, and the U.S. had some more silver and some some more bronze. So they went ahead in medal tally. China and the United States are proposing their own ways of life as the tool that is more effective. Now, India is caught in the dilemma. There is one thing which I do know. <coughs> uh, one thing which I do know, uh, you know, is the fact that Chinese are successful in their own way. U.S. is successful. Western capitalism is successful. Where does India go? 
because we are always madhyastha people and we keep vacillating between one over the other not knowing that it ends up hurting because you are either or you are a man or a woman in between you suffer so likewise what i want to say i wanted to request console please bring venus ji back in the on the stage she's dropped out of the whole thing uh, so the point which i am trying to say is that which path must india choose given its peculiar scenario venus ji did you hear my conversation earlier on uh, when i yes, was yes yes I, i did good so my question to both of you and i want to spend that time on the selection of the model that india must adopt to either delink or take full advantage of the communist principles the chinese model or the us model for its infrastructure for its people development which one must india embrace dekhiye ek baat batata hu indians are we are very vichitra kind of people sometimes i use the word vichitra <coughs> I have had encountered with variety varieties of people a software engineer traveling to dubai saying that look at dubai what a beautiful infrastructure it is so i said why not have it in india oh we are democracy no so we can't have what dubai does at the same time people who travel to china and united states they marvel at the great beautiful infrastructure that we enjoy here somebody asked me what will you miss if you leave united states and go back to india i said the pleasure of driving <laughs> so the point which i am trying to say is people will praise the chinese and the american infrastructure but when it comes to having it back home then all kinds of political ramifications get into play how does india overcome that you talked about earlier venus ji about infrastructure is about people when will people realize that whether it's capitalist model or so communist model china model you need the infrastructure so mm -hmm. there is a sacrifice involved and when will they be willing to do that to support the government agenda to build super infrastructure which as you said very correctly post galwan or pre galwan how india has built the himalayan traffic on that side to protect its own heritage this is the thing that i want to discuss in the remaining 10 12 minutes i think, uh, I think this there's one thing that i've mentioned in my chapter and i consider it very important because i have seen it in the corporate world this concept of cultural values you know which which determine industrial growth and i feel that in today's context you know today's context is unlike any other context so i somewhere also believe that we do have things to learn from the growth stories of various nations but we have our own story and our story is embedded in our context and it's a unique context you know so though we can learn you know we can imbibe things but we still would need to walk our own path like i had interviewed um, you know the chairperson of a country's fdi agency and i was discussing with him you know they had some amazing you know i mean that country i don't want to specify you know who was it uh, that country had some you know amazing growth stories and then i was asking them you know that you know china and india we almost started at the same time you know we we got independence in 1947 and then i was asking him that why did china take that leap and why did we not take that leap and why that specific country you know from where this official was why is that country able to embark on its own unique growth story and he told me a very simple thing very simple but very powerful statement he said it's an untrodden path <laughs> and i think it's an i think it's an, i think it's an untrodden path right i mean we are an american ally and i mention it you know in my in my chapter as well that you know we are a very important part of the indo pacific you know the way the quad is growing in the indo pacific we are a very important you know part of the of the quad uh, so we are a you know american ally our uh, strategic partnership with america is only grow growing and it will only grow further our people to people connect with america is very strong you know and on the other hand you know we cannot negate china as well because we share such a long border you know uh, with china uh, we both have extreme challenges and you know many opportunities uh, you know when it comes to our relationship with china but when we look at the context of our growth you know our context is not anywhere similar to the context of china 
you know, we didn't face the Ch communist revolution. We didn't have the context that the Chinese civilization or the Chinese nation had before that or after that. We also don't have the context to the growth and the development of democratic institutions or the economic growth of US. We have our own unique context. So therefore, our story has to be placed in our own unique context. And I think that's where the whole world is looking at India today, because as I said earlier, also, we are one sixth of the humanity. We are a very young nation, very, very young nation. We are the youngest nation of the world. It means that our growth story, you know, is not just going to be our opportunities and our challenges. It means that our growth story will be about the challenges and the opportunities for the rest of the world. And when I have been talking with American experts, you know, people, geopolitical analysts that I interview, there was something very interesting that somebody shared. They said that, you know, there are these democratic countries like U.S. and there are people over there, you know, people sitting in the think tanks, th thought leaders. They are thinking that there is going to be the rise of a new middle class in India. And how can world or these thinkers or these thought leaders contribute to the unfolding India story? Hmm. I'm talking about how some of them are thinking that I've been in contact with. So I feel a lot of thought leaders have already identified that India's growth story is unique to India. Obviously, you know, today's world is about narrative war. Today's uh, security perspectives are not just about territorial armies. You know, uh, war has become a pertinent you know, uh, issue. Uh, there is something called a narrative war also. So therefore, there are going to be international players who are going to influence us. They're going to influence our policy. They're going to try to influence our policies. They're going to try to influence the way we are cognizing our own story. Because obviously, you know, this dynamic growth story of India, it has both challenges and opportunities. Again, I'm repeating, not only for us, but for everybody you know who is a part of the global growth right now thank you very much and you will be happy to know that while the international think tankers are uh, wondering about how to influence the burgeoning middle class in india uh, you will be glad to know that i have a point many times on this show and other than that, that this century belongs to us the question yes. is whether we will be able to carry that narrative forward or not that's the yeah. classic million dollar question when it comes to us and Indians so we, and our polity, and yeah. we also counter the attacks. That's how right. do we also counter the attacks that are going to that we're going to constantly face? That you know, which will actually try to influence our cognition of our own self, our right. cognition of our own dynamic growth story. Brilliant, Ankitji. The same thing to you. Between, I mean, you have been a proponent of Sanatan economics and you have talked about bringing family back. We, we all, we know that our conversations have been that how the West has is self destroying itself by eliminating the element of family, right? Which is where it all begins. So how do we, I mean, take forward between, as Vinaji was saying, between the capitalist or communist methodologies and our narrative, how do we build that the remaining world begins to say, hey, there is a value in family, there is a value in this. And I will preface it by telling, sharing with my audience and you people again, that as a senator once told me that we love you Indians as immigrants to this country. You are professionals, you are hardworking, you are the highest median income, you have family values, you take care of your children, you are not a law and order problem anywhere in the world as an immigrant community, and you ask for nothing. Has the time come? for us to ask and assert for who we are and what our values are. Ankitji, you. So uh, this is my understanding that it is the Indian parenting which runs the geoeconomics of the entire world. It's not the children. It's the Indian parenting which is running the entire geoeconomics of this world across centuries. So uh, why is it so? Because one end of extreme capitalism is talking that individual is the lowest economic unit. The other end of extreme communism is talking uh, an unknown mob is the lowest economic unit. Right. 
it is only the indian sanatan economics model which is saying family is the lowest economic unit mm. so capitalism and communism both are actually nothing but outsourcing of family sacrifices on unknown people outside the family so either you are getting exploited by your grandfather or you want to be exploited by unknown people that is the choice that you got okay now uh, the fact that the growth that the united states and the chinese nation has seen uh, both these models uh, perpetually models based on predefining what benefits that can be exploited outside from others these are not home grown models of growth so first the united states with the endless printing currency benefit that it has which is obviously funding this kind of infrastructure and all that that was possible during the dollarization era uh, similar wall street finance was passed on to Ch chinese communist party after what i mentioned the 1979 president carter and deng xiaoping meeting that they had where deng xiaoping said that we want this kind of technology and he was told finish off your consumption so he comes back and announces a brutal single child policy okay now this kind of abrahamic economics where you believe this is the only life that you got based on religions of foreign origin in this kind of economic model uh, you lose your birth rates because this is a, it is a hyper consumption debt based model of growth which means you are stealing from the pockets of the future generation and spending it right now and then you are deploying women for a temporary gdp unit of labor in the british classroom model for supporting the pound as a single country reserve currency which started 400 years back in this you are losing the birth rate as well so one you want to steal from the future generations pocket and spend it right now but you don't want to give birth to the future generation how does this economic model survive so they have opened up the borders so they have opened up the borders in the european union they have opened up the borders in south america okay the mexicans are coming and everybody is coming from the texas and eagle pass and all that stuff because they realize who is going to pay the debts but those people who are coming in uh, they are coming in for freebies they are not coming in for working they are coming attracted to that dollar dollar endless printing machine okay so there is a imminent imminent clash that the europe and the american nation is going to witness when this clash of intents happen when the when the illegals who are entering they are coming for benefits but you think that they will do productivity and that's why they let you let them in right so clash is imminent i've already predicted in my book please repeat please please repeat what you missed out for Five seconds. You muted for about ten seconds. What did you say in your book? Yeah. Say okay. That. So I have mentioned in the book that how European Union is going to face crusades, uh, and because of these radicals who have come in, and UK will face partition, and United States, as we are seeing the dilution of fiat dollar cities, California because it is an IT capital, New York because it is a finance capital. a scripted de-dollarization that is going on with all the it and finance capitals worldwide look at the chinese growth that is also not an organic homegrown growth this is for sponsoring the democracy and the freedoms of the rest of the world the chinese tortured their own citizens and used their own natural resources and polluted their own nation okay now in this model the wall street was financing that endless printing of dollars which is why the chinese products were able to be sold below cost okay that is how they have sponsored the communist nation has sponsored their growth and taiwan and hong kong were used as uh, uh, as agencies for routing this free trade transaction while the mainland character was kept communist intact okay so they, they they enjoyed all the benefits of free trade but still kept the mainland communist 
because Taiwan and Hong Kong were used as a routing agency. Okay, so that growth was also not a normal growth. Which so India is never going to get that benefit of free Wall Street finance from the uh, endless printing machine of dollar. India is also not going to get the benefit of allowing stealing of tech from the West to uh, you know deploy tech here. Yeah, you won't be allowed that benefit. Why China was allowed that benefit? Because it was it was sponsoring the uh, the freedoms, the democracy, the art, dance, and culture the West was enjoying. That was that is why China was allowed those benefits. A quick quick okay. interruption. You said it was allowed. That means U.S. government did it deliberately. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I mean, uh, the first de-dollarization that happened was the launch of euro currency in the nineteen ninety nine. Okay. Uh, after that, the European Union said that we are no more going to park our savings in the U.S. dollar and U.S. Treasury, with which the entire IT sector bubble burst violently in what we call as the dot-com crash of 2002. So it was the Chinese Communist Party which promised that we will park our savings in U.S. Treasury, which is why U.S. brought China in WTO in 2001. And then, you know, it became the manufacturing giant that it has become. So we need to know if that was the first de-dollarization where the IT sector lost 78% valuations. This is the final de-dollarization going on. So you can imagine what is going to happen with the Western IT sector. What's the time frame for that? Next 20 months, I do believe the entire banking and the Western IT sector will be wrapping up. <laughs> I like I like the I like the way you very crystal clear manner you say they will be wrapping up. Okay, Garchalo of Office. I'm I'm on to the last, the last question. This is a fascinating conversation with two, the two young people here in India. Mm -hmm. And I'm enjoying it because I see hope for India in the future. If, if minds mm -hmm. like you and Vinaji uh, are successful in pushing the correct narrative. And the correct historical traditions of what we are, I think India has a great future. And I think I'm proud about that saying that this century belongs to India and you are the leaders of this entire movement. But I want to come back to one more thing the ability to cause disruption that's very important. Ability to cause disasters. How does India protect itself from digital theft, digital data vanishing? I mean, we in America. Everybody has conceded that my data is somewhere with the Chinese or somebody is already hacking it all out. Right? The other day, the news came about that my social security and everything else has already sold to China. So the Chinese have understood that everything in America has a price. If you are willing to pay the price, the thing is available. How does a common man protect itself? against the digital theft and data theft and identity theft, because that's what will inspire confidence. And that's why you are looking at, just as in food consumption, organic is fashion now back again. Wellness is fashion back again. Your GMO kind of things are no longer very valid. How does India protect itself against the digital theft, digital you know, piracy, which you, Venus, you experienced in the last few days? That will be the last question of the day. Then we'll talk again. Go ahead. Vinayji, you take off. I think I think uh, India's participation in multilateral platforms because digital infrastructure is not uh, is not something isolated. Obviously, the digital sphere is is not like how the territorial spheres are. So um, I think India's participation and India's leadership in multilateral you know, platforms like if you remember the India, Middle East, Europe corridor that was being uh, planned, uh, it was not just about territorial infrastructure, but it was also about digital infrastructure. And similarly, if you look at Quad, uh, you know, there are aspects of the digital infrastructure that are that are part of the Quad as well. Um, you know, when it comes to ensuring security, you know, between the partner countries. And obviously the digital theft, something we, we need to understand is that the digital theft is embedded in the geopolitical context. So 
yeah that's the most important thing uh we are being targeted and we are not being targeted just in the air or you know it is not just happens that it is happening with agendas um you know today the security uh, it involves um digital infrastructure as well and uh, the leading uh, you know defense establishments of leading countries they involve massive digital armies as well or what are called the cyber armies you know so um i think india has to rise to the occasion as per my recent discussions with security analyst you know um i've realized that you know india needs to bring this entire thing under the ambit of its national security uh, particularly you know digital infrastructure obviously the physical infrastructure also that's why you see in the last one decade uh, you know you see particularly massive infrastructural projects coming up in the border areas uh, if you have ever been to the prime minister's museum you know in the teen murti bhavan which is the former teen murti bhavan you can actually take a virtual helicopter ride you know there is a there is a service over there which will take you through the country's best and massive infrastructural projects you know but still somewhere the comprehension of digital infrastructure and how that digital infrastructure you know bridges the gap between the physical infrastructure and the services that are provided to the country or how the digital infrastructure is a very important aspect of the economic growth of the country you know or how every how it drops down to every individual how it is it is a significant part of the national security of the country as well as the individual security of the country you know i think all those concepts need to be built up uh, i have been observing past some time you know uh, i was very interested in community media and early in my career you know i used to work with communities establishing these community newspapers and nowadays i am seeing you know these instagram accounts and youtube accounts you know somewhere from some really far flung areas uh, of the country you know some amazing you know these accounts coming from northeast from ladakh you know from areas which generally even the journalists or the media houses are not able to reach you see these you know young people you know with the phones and because the 4g and the 5g has reached these places you know they are uh, providing us content from there but what we don't realize is with influences and with the ability to influence comes new challenges because this is kind of an open sphere right the boundaries of the digital world are not like the boundaries of the territorial world so with the new opportunities and the new things emerging new challenges are also emerging so right. somewhere you know we need to keep thinking we need to keep thinking specifically to our story and to the gro- to our growth story fantastic thank you ankit ji you have the last word yep so uh, as as i've been saying the it sector was Uh, created as a fake sector with the aapki voice phir ja rahi hai come back repeat that yeah gone about 20 seconds yeah uh, so uh, with the fiat dollar of 1971 the it sector was created and it came from the us defense unit uh, the idea was that uh, they will take all the merit of all other sectors in other nations to the it sector and make them do coolie jobs and pay the highest level that they can pay from the americans so i mean compared to other work that they do within those countries this is how the merit was taken to the it sector which destroyed innovation in all the core sectors which is agriculture manufacturing food processing logistics defense space and all that and the merit was made to do kuli task instead of doing some real it products so what happened with that is uh, we what i mean in one of the speeches jay shankar ji himself spoke about this that we were till now fitting ourselves into the global plans of others so now what happens with de dollarization is instead of doing that outsourcing and back office kind of call centers and that kind of task we we will be able to deploy our merit in innovation in real it innovation hmm. 
and the more we move towards a swadeshi technological movement the more we will have sovereignty towards uh, maintaining the security uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, the data of our citizens is not leaked and made misuse of as we all know the kind of foreign interference that we know even during the election times right right yes so the the big tech needs to be either the de platform but we need to have our own home grown inbuilt options ready before we even attempt that uh, and then we have to secure those platforms as well so uh, 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 talking to the enemy's population directly bypassing the enemy's leadership is a lethal weapon of war and this and this is being used via technology so as i said a swadeshi technology movement and a technology ombudsman as well will be required so that artificial intelligence does not go to the extreme where uh, human beings become uh, unproductive and then you have to give some benefits by taxing people even more companies right. even more so ai also need to be uh, uh, you know in a way regulated in the sense that we as a country because we have huge masses right we have population so we have to uh, do a check and balance over there with a the technology ombudsman thank you so much it has been a very very lively and very enlightening conversation because you know i i'm i'm delighted and honored to be part of the same team that we came together to put together a book on dismantling or what you call what we have called geopolitics geopolit redefined our narrative the indic narrative and you know i'm 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 delighted to be part of this and this move this is actually you know i told siddharth ji actually if he's listening to it he will, when he listens to it he will confirm that we need to follow which i coined the phrase c3m formula because our hindu ecosystem is so individualistic that we need to somewhere along the line come together everybody talks about coming together hindu unity and i proposed collaborate cooperate coordinate and mobilize that thought this book that we have done together is is an outstanding example of how the hindu ecosystem yes must continue thank you for sure i was i have a version so i was showing that part you know by this is here there you go so i wanted to say to people that you know that's why i'm talking about to the viewers pay attention to the how 11 or 12 minds have come together we have done two books so far this is the second one we did the first one we are going to come back again with third one at some opportune time basically our idea is to recreate the narrative as our narrative which all of us agree on yes vinay ji boliye yeah i i mean listening to you i suddenly have a new thought in my head i yes. i i was thinking that maybe the development of a social capital should also be a part of a growth story you know it should be considered a significant part of a growth story as well as the you know development of our infrastructure absolutely totally agree totally agree you know it's, it's like you know when i was involved with the think tank in the us uh, for 12 years uh, you know the thing was about evaluating trends social technology economics and politics step evaluating the steps because each one impacts the other one so we created these four major categories because everything else falls within each one of them right and then analyze the impact and implication of these elements so this book does that and i will urge viewers and i'm not doing a book promo i'm trying to tell you here that we have created an ecosystem for once which is actually the indic ecosystem thoughts and how the west western ideas are no longer relevant for us so you know yesterday we had india day parade and celebration i wore my indian coat and indian jacket to the event why should i wear a suit and tie and a pant look at the how they have created the institution that if you wear suit tie and everything you look smarter you know wo jo dilip kumar ka gana hai na sala mein to sahab ban gaya you know ये सूट मेरा देखो ये बूट मेरा देखो दैट मैं तो गोरा चिट्टा लंदन का सो आई वांट टू यू नो आवर सेल्स हु हैव हैड द बेनिफिट एंड अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इंटरेक्ट विद द यूनिवर्स अराउंड अस टू गो बैक एंड सी द वर्चुअल्स एंड मेरिट्स 
and the beauty of our own system. So thank you very much for joining viewers and thank you very much Venus ji and for the first time being on Jaipur Dialogue USA and Ankit ji past master in this entire batting arena. So thank we'll you. continue our association. Satya Me Vijayate. I always end my program with the invocation Satya Me Vijayate. For truth to triumph, we need to stand up and fight for it. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.